I am Sister Melita Chozik of the Order of the Adorers of the Blood of Christ. We are now located in the convent of Nova Topola. As an order, we had a pretty hard time of it during the war, but it's hard to talk about it. Horrific things happened. There are so many memories that are really bad. We were raided a few times. Sometimes they threw explosives in, at others they simply broke in. Finally, in 1995, we were driven out of the home. The Serbian, let's call it a military force, gathered us all up wherever we were. We had just finished preparing the preserves for the winter and a little bit of firewood, and we thought that we could endure here for the winter. But they sought us out wherever we were and interrogated us. Who are you? What nationality are you? What is your name? There were other women who were there helping us. And, depending on how they presented themselves, if they said they were Croat, they were forced into a car to cross the Saba River. The convent of the Adorers of the Precious Blood was ransacked and badly damaged during the recent war in Bosnia-Herzegovina. Apart from the terror that the sisters experienced, what's particularly disturbing is the fact that to this day no light has been thrown on the disappearance of Father Ratko Grgic, the parish priest who was forcefully taken from his home in 1992. For that reason, with particular delicacy, the head of the order has decided to set up the community again in Novatopola. We are nuns who have a vow of obedience. Our superiors were trying to think up ways in which our convent would have the mission of being a means of reconciliation in the area. They tried to find the right way to do it. The means through which they achieved this was through an apostolate of curing with medicinal herbs, which the sister convent had been doing in Bosansky Aleksandrovac before the war. When we arrived, we thought that perhaps we should bring the practice of herb collecting to this convent too, so that we wouldn't just be an end in ourselves, but that we should contribute to the peace process by reaching out to our neighbours, reconciling and finally forgiving. And that's how this work came about. We hadn't even fixed up the convent for daily living, and people were already beginning to call in seeking medicines, saying, Sister, so-and-so saved me many years ago by giving me such and such a medicine. Can you make up the same stuff? So that was our motivation and it really took off. In order to begin their apostolate, the convent had to undergo repairs at least of the essential requirements and the surrounding areas. An international charity organisation of the Catholic Church aid to the church in need, reacted positively to this cry for help with their donations. This is where the first hospital was, when the first sisters were driven out. Here all was overgrown, derelict. We didn't have any access to it then. Passing from the road, we could see that it was all overgrown. The convent couldn't even be seen the way it can be seen today. We have been here for four years now, and we are continuously cleaning although it's in bad condition still, so you can imagine how it was back then. People from all over the country, regardless of nationality or creed, aren't waiting for the convent to finish restoration. They come looking for help and they go away satisfied and grateful. We came here with the idea that we want to be at their disposal, that we wish to give glory to God, to make reparation for the errors of these people. In our prayers we intercede for all those who have done wrong to our sisters, not just in this area, but everywhere, not just in this convent, but all over Banja Luka. 
I always felt that someone must make reparation for them so that their souls could be redeemed, saved, or at least have the opportunity of an encounter with the true God. The war brought about horrific consequences that no one could ever have envisaged. The director of Caritas describes the atmosphere that preceded the war here in Bosnia-Herzegovina. We didn't actually believe that a war would break out, even though there were a lot of indications that it might. I remember that the older members of my family said that this would eventually lead to war, but I was taught that this was fraternity and unity, that our army was the Yugoslav People's Army and that it would protect everyone. Since we weren't communists and we weren't really supportive of that system of government, but we didn't see ourselves as having enemies, we didn't hold anything against anyone. We had never committed offences against anyone, although that was being put across in the media at that time for the more experienced, was reason for alarm. Personally, I just thought it was part of making us into a democracy, that it would go from one extreme to another before it would stabilize with time. But in retrospect, when I think about what was written in the Belgrade press, I would say that it was a systematic preparation for war. But that's a conclusion I came to in hindsight. Those of us from the area had already been warned that something was in the pipeline. We saw and heard about arms being supplied. We heard that our neighbours were under threat. We couldn't understand by whom because the other two nationalities in question were unarmed. When the war broke out in Croatia and all that chaos with it, we were still under communism here. However, we now know that we really hadn't any experience and we didn't realize in time what the whole thing was about. Arms had been distributed among the Serbian population here, and the army here at that time really was in the hands of one people only. Little by little, the officers that belonged to other nations were pushed aside, then the same with the soldiers, so that the Yugoslavian army had actually become a purely Serbian armed force. The intimidation of the Serbian majority over the other citizens of Banja Luka, together with the anxiety and economic breakdown, marked the beginning of the tragedies. Soon the situation became very tense. It wasn't immediately outright warfare, but this area became more and more cut off. Inflation grew terribly fast so that from morning to nightfall money could lose up to 100% of its value. I mean it was devalued. A panic began to be felt among the people, a feeling that you couldn't rely on anything. Your salary or your pension just didn't cover everything. If you were a little late, it squared the accounts of the house, but after two or three days you could only buy a fraction of what you could have bought before with it. Already, the basic essentials were lacking. In 1991, that was the first time that we went looking for help to a parish in Slavonia, in neighboring Croatia, and we got three tons of flour from that parish. We brought it here, and that was our first handout with regards to material help. We had to look after the local people here more and more. Some of them had been fired because they refused to sign up for the army. There were people whose property had been raided, so that more and more people came here, not just Catholics. Orthodox and Muslims came too to Caritas. We were open all the time for whoever was in need, and in that way I think we did a lot to ease the tension in this area. Because healthcare didn't even minimally exist for the Catholics here, Caritas of the Diocese 